All right, hi everyone. I hope you're doing well. So in this lecture video, we're going to carry on with the concept of behavior modification by talking about token economies. So this is lecture video 14. Now, when we talk about token economies, I'm going to be incorporating some information from another textbook that I've used to teach a behavior modification course at Mississippi State. So there'll be some extra things here that are not specifically in your textbook. But of course, as always, if you have questions, let me know. So the main idea behind a token economy is to to be able to bridge the gap between the behavior that we want to reinforce and that reinforcer that we want to give. We can't always give that big reinforcer right away. So we're going to talk about ways to bridge that gap. We're also going to be thinking about how to use a behavior modification plan with several individuals. Like for example, if you're a teacher and you have several students in your classroom, how can you make that work in a way that's not excessively time consuming. So there will be an activity, activity 11, that will be um, discussed in the video. Remember that you do get two drop grades for activities. So um, you can get up to 100 points from activities. Each one is worth 10 points. So if you have gotten full credit on the first 10 activities, then you don't have to complete activities 11 and 12. Of course, if you would like to, you can. If you have questions about whether or not it would be beneficial for you to complete activities 11 and 12, uh, feel free to send me an email. So just let me know if you have questions. Let's go ahead and get started. All right, so as I said, today we're going to be talking about applications of behavior modification, and we are going to be talking primarily about token economies, but before we do that, there were still a few slides left in our crash course for behavior modification set of slides that we're going to be finishing up first. So we talked last time about operant conditioning, about how it involves reinforcement, which is anything intended to increase a behavior, as well as punishment, which is anything intended to decrease behavior. So today we're gonna to start off by going into a little bit more detail about different types of reinforcement and punishment. So it talks here about reinforcement schedules. What you need to know is that when you choose to reinforce a behavior, you have several different options. You can go with what we call continuous reinforcement, which you'll see referenced again on the next slide. Continuous reinforcement, just like it sounds, means that you reinforce a behavior every single time that it happens. Now, as you'll see on the next slide, this is usually where we want to start, but this is not somewhere that we want to stay for very long. There are lots of reasons why you might not want to give a reinforcer every single time that an individual does an appropriate behavior. And you have options here. We'll talk about reinforcement schedules. Token economies also gives us a potential solution to this as well, but we'll get there in a second. You may not want to give a reinforcer every time a positive behavior happens because, first of all, you might not be able to. There may be times when you're not able to stop what you're doing and attend to uh, the child and giving them a specific reinforcer every single time. Also, you don't want the child to become excessively dependent on the reinforcers. And if you give a reinforcer every single time, depending on what kind of reinforcer that is, that could become expensive or cumbersome for you as the parent or the teacher. But also, when we're talking about giving a reinforcer every single time, that might make an individual satiate on that reinforcer more quickly. And all I mean by that is, when a reinforcer is uh, given to you excessively, you don't really want it anymore. So there is a point where you say, okay, I don't really need this reinforcer anymore, and therefore it loses its power. So if you give a reinforcer every time, then the individual might get bored with it, get tired of it, and that's what I mean when I say that they satiate on it. They're satisfied, they don't want any more. <clears throat> so you might start off with continuous reinforcement, but after a while you're gonna wanna switch to a different kind of reinforcement schedule. So these are types of intermittent reinforcement, which just means that you don't give the reinforcer every single time, but you have a plan for how to give a reinforcer. So we'll briefly talk about each of these. You'll see, first of all, that there are fixed and variable scales here. And you'll also see that there are ratio and interval scales. So ratio is gonna refer to behaviors. Interval is gonna refer to time. So with a fixed ratio scale, 
or schedule, <clears throat> then you're going to reinforce after a set number of responses. So this would be like saying you can have a piece of candy for every three math problems you do. That's not continuous reinforcement. Continuous reinforcement would be you get a piece of candy for every math problem you do. But in this particular situation, with a fixed ratio, the person knows how many times they have to do the behavior before they get the reward. And one thing to note here is that that then gives the person some measure of control over when they get the reward. So if I tell my son that he can have a piece of candy if he does three math problems, then assuming that they're math problems that he is capable of doing, then he then can decide, am I going to take my time, drag this out, get distracted, or am I going to work hard, pay attention, and get these done quickly? So it's not about how long it takes you to do the behaviors, it's about how many behaviors you do. Maybe you have uh, been on a sports team and the coach says, okay, you run two more laps and you get a water break, something like that. So this is fixed ratio. You know how many responses you have to complete before you get the reward. On the other hand, variable ratio, the ratio part tells us that it's still about behaviors. However, the variable part tells us that the person being reinforced does not know how often he or she will have to do the behavior before they get the reward. Now you, as the person giving the reward, might have a plan in your head, but the individual doing the behavior doesn't know. So this would be like me telling my son, okay, sit down and start doing your math problems. And he does five math problems, I give him a piece of candy. And then he sits down and keeps working. In the next two problems, I give him a piece of candy. And then six problems, I give him a piece of candy. So it's a different number of problems every time. I might have a plan in my head about how many he's going to have to do before he gets the next piece of candy. But he doesn't know because it's not consistent. Another classic example of a variable ratio schedule would be gambling. So if you go to a casino and you sit down on a slot machine, you do not know how many times you're going to have to put a coin into that machine before you win the money. And this is partly why gambling is addictive, because you keep thinking to yourself, well, it could be one more, one more and I could win a million dollars, and that's possible. Or you could sit there and put coins in all day and not win anything. So it's variable ratio, the person does not know how many times they have to do the behavior before they get the reward. Uh, another example here, uh, my husband and I like to go thrift store shopping. I have a little bit of a book problem. And by a little bit of a book problem, I mean, I don't think you can ever have too many books. But if you can have too many books, I have too many books. But it's one of those things where we feel like we have to go to the thrift store because if we don't go, there might be good books there. And somebody else might buy them. It's the, we've had days where we go and there's nothing there we want. But you keep thinking today could be the day when they could have all the Dr. Seuss books I'm missing in my kids' collection. Anyway, that's a whole other conversation. But that's variable ratio. On the other hand, your interval scales or interval schedules are going to be based on time rather than a number of behaviors. So with a fixed interval scale, the person has to wait a certain amount of time, and the first time they do the behavior after that time passes, they'll get rewarded. Now one thing to note is that you do still have to do the behavior. The appropriate response still has to happen, but basically you have to wait for a fixed amount of time, and as soon as that amount of time passes, the first time you do the behavior, you get the reward. Um, there are several different potential examples of this. Um, imagine that you have a TV show that you enjoy watching that comes on Thursday nights at 7 o'clock. I have no idea. It's been a really long time since I've watched a, uh, a lot of network television. But let's say you have a favorite TV show that comes on Thursdays at 7. Okay, You still have to turn your television on. The, the behavior that leads to the reward is turning on your television. However, you have to wait a fixed amount of time before you can get rewarded for turning on your television. There's no way to speed this process up. You can turn your television on every five minutes all day on Thursday, but that's not going to speed up your television show coming on. But the first time you do the behavior, after that fixed amount of time passes, you get the reward. Another example here, uh, what if a professor said she was going to be posting grades at 3 o'clock? 
Now, I don't know if you've ever had this situation. This could be potentially reinforcing or punishing, depending on how hard you've been working. But uh, if your final grade is going to be posted at 3 o'clock, it does not matter how many times you check your grade throughout the day. There's nothing you can do to speed it up. Uh, you have to wait a fixed amount of time, and the first time you check after 3 o'clock, you'll get the reinforcement. On the other hand, a variable interval means that the first time you do the behavior after a variable amount of time, you will get the reward. This would be like, I don't know when this TV show comes on, so I keep checking. Or I don't know when the teacher's going to post the grade, so I keep checking. You're going to have to do the behavior after a certain amount of time passes, but you don't know how much time has to pass before you're going to get the reward. Now, when we're talking about variable scales, what always comes to my mind here is fishing. I don't do a lot of fishing. I'm certainly not great at fishing. Uh, but what I will say here is that there are different styles of fishing um, depending on your attention span. So fishing could be a variable ratio scale, and this is what it is for me because I don't have a great attention span. Uh, basically, if I were to go fishing, I would cast the line and reel it in, cast the line and reel it in. I'm not very good at waiting. So basically here we're saying I don't know how many times I have to do the behavior before I get the reward of catching a fish. But for other people, uh, and I'm told by my husband's stepfather that this is the correct way to go fishing, is to cast the line and leave it and let it sit there. And if you're doing that where you're casting and you're just letting it sit, that's a variable interval. You don't know how much time is going to pass before you catch a fish. Now remember, things that are variable are more addictive because you don't know. It could be the next behavior. It could be that next minute when you actually get your reinforcement. Okay, so some guidelines here. As I said, continuous reinforcement means you're reinforcing every single time, and initial learning is probably better. You start off with continuous reinforcement. This is because if it's a behavior that the individual is not doing at all, or a behavior they're not doing very much, it may be hard for them to get started. Think about if you decided you wanted to exercise, but you've never really exercised before. You might need that reinforcer every time at first. Otherwise, you might give up too soon. Now, after a while, after the behavior is kind of established, then you can switch to reinforcing based on one of those schedules we just talked about. But continuous reinforcement helps get a person started. It also helps show them that the reinforcer is something they want. But if we continue to do this, the person may get bored with that reinforcer. Like I said, they may satiate on it. Or you just may not be able to keep this up, especially in a classroom setting when you will be reinforcing every student every time and you have several students. That would pretty much take up your whole day. But we'll also talk about another option for this when we talk about token economies. If you are able to, you will do better on a variable interval schedule or a variable ratio schedule is also good. Uh, fixed schedules tend to be a little less effective. So as I said, variable ratio or variable interval schedules are kind of addictive. I, the next time I do it, I could get rewarded maybe, or the next minute I could get my reward. With fixed schedules, students tend to get a little bit bored. And because of that, they tend to show uh, less persistence. So they may not work for the reinforcer anymore because it's not interesting to them as much. And faster response extinction, we mentioned extinction last time as just unlearning. So basically, if it stops being reinforcing, then the person won't work for it anymore. So if at all possible, the variable schedules are probably the way to go. All right. What happens if you want to reinforce a behavior, but your goal is something that is out of reach at the moment? And it's going to take a lot of baby steps to get you to your goal. How can you do reinforcement in that situation? Let me give you an example. Let's go back to the exercise. Uh, I have children. I have young children. So I feel like I get enough exercise chasing my young children around. However, I have not been inside of a gym probably since 2008. If I'm being honest. So <clears throat> let's say that I decided I wanted to run a marathon. <laughs> right. I know. If you know me, you're laughing. But let's just say that for an example. It would not be helpful for me to say, okay, I'm going to reinforce myself for if I go out tomorrow and run a marathon. A, I couldn't do it. I'd die or hurt myself. 
Uh, but B, I would never get that reinforcer. So the reinforcer's not good for me anymore. This would be like telling my, my young children, okay, well, we're in, we need to learn how to read, so here's what I want you to do. I want you to read War and Peace. I'll buy you, I mean, it doesn't matter what it is. I tell my kids, I'll buy you a pony if you read War and Peace. My kids can't read War and Peace right now. I'll certainly not at least read it and comprehend it. So sometimes your goal is something that cannot be accomplished in one fell swoop. It's something that has a lot of baby steps along the way, and that's where shaping comes in. You can think of shaping like you're working with pottery. You're starting off with a lump of clay and you're gradually making it look more and more like the pot you want it to be. So, this involves teaching new behaviors by reinforcing, and here's our key term, successive approximations of the desired behavior. What this means is, we start off with a step that is a step in the right direction, but it's still pretty far away from our goal and then we gradually get closer and closer to our goal. So let's say that my end goal, my terminal goal as they call it, is to run a marathon. My first step might be just walking around the block. I mean really, that may be where I start. And I may have to reinforce myself heavily, heavily for doing that. And I do that for a little while. For a little while I reinforce myself for walking around the block, but I don't stay there. Because if I stay there and I keep reinforcing myself for that, I'll never run a marathon. So after that behavior becomes established, then I stop rewarding myself for walking around the block. Now I'm going to reward myself for walking a half a mile. Do that for a little while, and then now you only get the reinforcer if you walk a whole mile, and then two miles, and then three miles, and so on and so forth. What we're saying is we're gradually working towards our goal by meeting several smaller goals that all approximate or resemble or get closer to my final goal, right? So if you're teaching your child how to read, the first step is the alphabet. But you can't just stop at the alphabet because then your child would never learn how to read. They would just know the, the letter sound. So after a while, you stop reinforcing for the alphabet. You start reinforcing for short vowel words and then long vowel words and then little short reader books and that kind of thing. You start off with a behavior they are capable of being successful at. If you start off with a step that is too difficult, they won't be motivated because they'll never get the reinforcer and the behavior won't happen. However, if you continue to reinforce the easy behavior for too long, they'll never progress. So you have to choose a pace and you have to pace yourself appropriately here. So first you reward any response that resembles at all. And then after that, you want each step, each response, each behavior to get closer and closer or to look more and more like your final goal behavior until you reach that target behavior. All right. Very good. <clears throat> what about some more information about how to decrease undesirable behaviors? So we talked about options a little bit last time. We mentioned negative punishment and positive punishment. Negative punishment involves removing something desirable. So if I say, okay, you can't have your toys, you can't have your TV time, you can't have dessert, uh, that kind of thing. Or you can't have attention. So this would also be taking somebody's, uh, taking attention away, whatever the case may be. You can also use positive punishment where you add something unpleasant like extra chores or extra broccoli or this is nagging someone, shame, guilt, that kind of thing. So punishment is an option, but there may be certain situations in which you don't want to use punishment. We like to reward behave, positive behaviors a lot more than we punish bad behaviors, if at all possible. And so then this is where differential reinforcement comes in, which is something that is fantastic. If you have a problem behavior you want to decrease, you could directly punish that problem behavior or you could reinforce a behavior that is incompatible with it, okay? So <clears throat> let's say you have a child in the classroom that is constantly poking the person that sits in front of him. This is annoying. This is disruptive. You could punish the child whenever he pokes his neighbor or you could reinforce the child for sitting on his hands. I get that this is complicated because the child may need his hands to do his lessons, but let's assume you're doing something where the child doesn't have to have his hands right now. You could reinforce the child for sitting on his hands, which will necessarily decrease the poking the neighbor because you can't poke your neighbor if you're sitting on your hands. 
of course, kids get creative and they might start kicking or whatever else. So you have to keep that an eye on that. But the idea is if you're doing a behavior you shouldn't be doing, reinforcing an opposite behavior will decrease that problem behavior. So what happens if you find yourself always saying negative things about other people? You could punish yourself for saying negative things about other people, or you could reinforce yourself for saying kind things about other people. It's very hard, I don't know, in the South, we may have mastered this, but it's challenging to insult someone and compliment someone at the same time. I know we have the bless your heart uh, Southern thing, but once again, uh, differential reinforcement, I'm getting off track today. Differential reinforcement is reinforcing an incompatible behavior instead of punishing the bad behavior. Also, you could terminate reinforcement. This is extinction here. Extinction means if you stop reinforcing something that has been reinforced, that behavior will probably stop. Well, sometimes kids have been reinforced for bad behaviors. Think about the child that curses, and it's funny, right? It's funny when kids curse, unless it's your kid, and then it's maybe not so funny. But um, sometimes a child says something or does something to get attention because other people laugh or other people find it amusing. So what you can do is say, okay, well, somehow we've started reinforcing bad behaviors. Instead of punishing the bad behavior, it could be enough to just remove the reinforcement. When they say something like that, you just don't pay attention to them. Completely ignore them whatsoever. And if they're doing it to get attention, that may be enough to make them stop. All right. We are also going to talk about token economies today. So that was just a little bit of information left over from the last set of slides. One thing to note is that this information, as well as the information we're gonna be talking about in the next video on functional assessment, uh, is not something that I got directly out of your textbook. This is additional information that I'm providing for you guys. So make sure that you're paying attention to the lecture videos. Make sure you let me know if you have any questions. I wanted to talk about token economies because they are incredibly helpful when you're working with a group of individuals and you want to reinforce good behaviors. So to be able to understand token economies, first of all, we have to talk about the difference between unconditioned reinforcers and conditioned reinforcers. Now, when we talked about classical conditioning, we said the term unconditioned just means it happens naturally, whereas the term conditioned means we had to learn this. This is something we've learned. So an unconditioned reinforcer is something that we naturally find reinforcing. We don't have to learn to like it. So, for example, candy. Most kids do not have to learn to like candy. Uh, most kids are born, and I still think most adults uh, have a, a sweet tooth where they enjoy candy regardless. Uh, there are several other things that could go into this category. What about comfort? Feeling comfortable is reinforcing. Nobody had to teach you to like comfort. A sleep? Sleep is reinforcing. The older you get, the more kids you have, the more reinforcing sleep is. So there are some reinforcers that, from the very first time, you enjoy them. Condition reinforcers, on the other hand, are things that you have to learn have value. So they're learned through being paired with other reinforcers. A great example of a condition reinforcer is money. The first time an individual is confronted with money, that may not be reinforcing for them. They don't understand what money does. Money is a piece of paper. You could color on it. If it's a child, you're flushing it down the toilet, throw it out the window, rip it up, draw on it, put it in your mouth, which is probably not a good idea. But you give a very young child a $100 bill, and that doesn't mean anything to them. How does money gain its value? Because it's paired with other reinforcers. You learn that you can take that money and exchange it for something you want. You get a $100 bill on your birthday, and you're like, hey, I can go whatever. Go to a restaurant. Uh, go to Walmart or you know pay your bill paying a bill is also kind of reinforcing adulthood may be sounding very boring today but whatever the case may be you learn that money is reinforcing because it can be exchanged for other things that you want so money is an example of a token a token is a condition reinforcer that can be collected and exchanged for backup reinforcers so <clears throat> let's have a classroom example Let's say that a teacher gives out uh, stickers. 
the stickers are the token. And the first time you get a sticker, you might think, okay, what do I care? What do I care about stickers? But then the teacher explains that when you get five stickers, you can go pick something out of the prize box. Or when you get 10 stickers, you can get a homework pass and not have to do your homework. Well, the stickers are tokens. The backup reinforcers are the things that you exchange the tokens to get. Things like a prize from the prize box. Uh, it could be a small toy, piece of candy, or something like a homework pass, or a coupon for free ice cream. So the backup reinforcer is something that you get in exchange for your tokens. Without backup reinforcers, tokens are useless. If you were stranded on an island with a hundred million dollars, it would do you no good. Because there's nothing to buy, there's nothing to exchange, there's no value to that token without the backup reinforcers. <clears throat> Alright, now, why use condition reinforcers? Why use tokens? Why not just say, here's your prize box, or here's your homework pass, you know, straight away. Child does a good behavior, give them the reward. Well, there's a reason for that. <clears throat> First of all, we said in our last video that our reinforcement is most effective if given consistently and immediately. You do not want to wait for some time after the individual does a good behavior before they get the reward. It's strongest if you get the reward immediately. The problem is you may not be able to do that. If you're in a classroom and you have 25 students and every time they did something good, they one of the other of them is, is going back and forth to the prize box, you wouldn't get anything done all day long. So first of all, you can give these tokens more immediately and that immediacy is important and you can combine this with praise like good job you did good you get a sticker or other ways you could do this it could be a point system you keep track you get a, a tally mark on the wall on by your name or you get a, a marble in a jar and when you get a certain number number of marbles you get to pick a prize whatever the case may be the idea is you can give the token immediately and so this helps bridge the delay between the behavior and the more powerful reinforcer. So the individual is still reinforced, but also this helps with satiation. Because if you go get to go to the prize box every time you do a good behavior, the person's going to get tired of that. But if you get a token and a pat on the back every time you do a good behavior, and then every so often you get to exchange your tokens for a trip to the prize box, you don't get so bored with the prize box. And also, bonus, the teacher doesn't have to fill up the prize box as often because students are not getting a prize every time they do something well. Now, a few things to keep in mind if you want your token economy to be successful. First of all, the strength of the backup reinforcers. Remember that your token is your condition reinforcer. You accumulate tokens, whether they be points or stickers or whatever, and then you exchange those for backup reinforcers. This will only work if the backup reinforcers are something that the individual wants. And I use a lot of examples with kids. This could work for college students too. I'm sure you guys would participate in a token economy for certain backup reinforcers. So I may be uh, in danger of being stereotypical here. But what kinds of backup reinforcers do college students want? extra credit, uh, Starbucks gift cards, free food. I mean, there are, there are backup reinforcers that work for you. There are backup reinforcers that work for children. Uh, and you know your child, or if you're the teacher, hopefully you know the students in your classroom and you know what they like. But if you fill up your prize box with things that nobody wants, then your token economy will fail. So, uh, for example, if I told my kids, yeah, you go you do three or four math problems, you get a token, after a while you build up your tokens and you can have extra time to do chores or extra broccoli to eat, they're not going to want to do that. So actually what happens there is I am punishing them for doing the target behavior. We don't want to do that. So choose backup reinforcers they want. And if you're not sure what backup reinforcers they want, ask them. What kinds of things could I put in my prize box to make my prize box attractive to you? Now, in addition to choosing 
uh, reinforcers they like, you should also choose a variety of reinforcers. As many as you can. Now, <clears throat> there may be times where your options are limited here. But as much as possible, you would like to use a generalized condition reinforcer. A simple condition reinforcer is where you build up your tokens and you can only exchange them for one thing. So, for example, there are certain credit cards that if you spend a certain amount of money or use it a certain number of times, you get airline miles. And that's really all you can do is you get these points that you can exchange for airline miles. Well, if you're a person who travels frequently, then that may be super reinforcing for you. But for most of us, that's not really that helpful. Uh, another example of this, what if a teacher said to her students, you can build up your tokens and exchange them for um, ice cream coupons? Well, students might get tired of ice cream. Or there'll be some students who won't be that interested in ice cream. After a while, they'll get bored. So, with a generalized condition reinforcer, you can exchange your tokens for many different things. So this is basically money. Money is the ultimate generalized condition reinforcer. You can take money and buy anything that, that someone will sell to you for that amount of money. So money is a great example. A gift card could be another example here. So the strength depends in part on the number of different backup reinforcers available for it. This will help maintain interest and make it uh, harder for the students to satiate. Now I use that term satiate. Satiate just means you get satisfied and you don't want any more of the reinforcer. <clears throat> so there are a few examples here uh, of condition reinforcers. So a simple condition reinforcer is something that can only be exchanged for one thing. So like you might get a coupon for a free hamburger. Well that's great, but after a certain point you'll be tired of hamburgers. Uh, a subway token where you get to ride the subway. That's the only good that you can get. The only thing you can get from a subway token is uh, being able to ride the subway. Uh, can generalized condition reinforcers, money, as I said, is the ultimate um, generalized condition reinforcer. They list praise here. Um, that's not going to be a test question. I'm not 100% sure I would put praise here, but this is where this, these particular people listed it. But uh, a gift certificate. So if somebody gave you a gift card to Amazon, that's as good as money, right? There are so many different things you can choose. Basically, the more variety you provide, the more likely it is that a person will stay interested and work harder for it. And so these are condition reinforcers, things you have to learn that you like. Uh, unconditioned reinforcers, things that come naturally, uh, food, water, sex, physical comfort, sleep, novelty. Uh, I feel like this goes without saying, but um, this, this information was included in a behavior modification class. Uh, Sex is not something you're, you're going to be thinking about with educational psychology, but it's still an example of unconditioned reinforcer. Uh, but think about novelty. So novelty is like excitement, getting to do something new. That's not something that you learn to like. Everybody likes a little bit of excitement. Now, your personality might determine how much excitement you can handle, but everybody likes at least a little bit of excitement, right? All right. One thing to keep in mind you want to look out for extinction of your conditioned reinforcer. So, first of all, remember that conditioned reinforcer is your token. Extinction means that you have lost your conditioning. So, what happens if I no longer give my backup reinforcers? Then my tokens are useless. So, what happens if the students in my classroom have earned 100 marbles in their marble jar but haven't gotten to trade those for anything? What happens if my kids have collected 45 stickers on their sticker chart and haven't gotten a chance to turn those in for anything? If you don't give backup reinforcers, tokens are useless. You can just think about being stranded on an island, surrounded by your money that doesn't do you any good. So make sure that you do provide opportunities for individuals to exchange their condition reinforcers or their tokens. They can turn those in to get backup reinforcers if at all possible, a variety of backup reinforcers that he or she is interested in. All right, now, another question you might have is, how soon should I provide a backup reinforcer? I don't want to give a backup reinforcer for every token, because then the token is useless. 
here's a token, go to the prize box. Here's a token, go to the prize box. No, I want my students to build up tokens first before they can go get their backup reinforcers. But how many tokens should they have to earn? Well, it depends. It depends on the difficulty of the behavior that the child is doing for the first time. It depends on the level of interest the child has in the behavior. It also depends on the age. Older individuals are usually able to wait longer. They can delay their gratification a little bit longer. So early on, you want to give backup reinforcers soon because you're teaching them to want the token. When the teacher says, okay, you get a marble in your marble jar, the child's going to be like, can I play with the marble? And you're like, no, that's not what it's for. Well, then what do I want a marble for? So you might do that really early. You might say, yay, you got three marbles. Go pick a prize because you want them to learn the marbles are good. Remember, these are condition reinforcers. You have to learn to like them. But once the child says, hey, I can get good things when I get marbles or points or stickers or whatever, then you can gradually increase this delay. Now you have to get four marbles, five marbles, six marbles, eight marbles before you go to the prize box or before you get a backup reinforcer. So you start off doing it early, doing it frequently, and then you can increase the delay. All right. As I said, you want to use generalized condition reinforcers whenever possible. This is the idea that your tokens can be exchanged for many different things. This helps maintain some interest, some variety. You wouldn't go to a restaurant for very long if they only had one or two things on their menu. You like being able to choose and the person will very easily get bored and satiated if there's only one or two things to choose from. Also, you may want to mix it up. You may find that even if you do use generalized condition reinforcers, over time, they may get tired of all of your prizes, and that's fine, and then it's just time to come up with new prizes to replace those. And you can always ask the, the student or your child, are you still interested in this prize? Do you have any suggestions for other prizes that, that might be more um, enticing for you? Also, apply the same rules you used for primary positive reinforcers, which is just directly reinforcing a behavior without a token. So we talked about specifically doing this consistently. Whatever your plan is, make sure that the, the students understand your plan, give it consistently, and give it immediately. Remember, you're not going to be giving your backup reinforcer immediately, but you're going to be giving your condition reinforcer or your token immediately. That way they stay interested. All right, so just to review, make sure you guys are following the terms I'm using here. A condition reinforcer is something that is not originally reinforcing. If it is originally reinforcing, that's an unconditioned reinforcer. So with a condition reinforcer, it is not originally reinforcing, but it becomes reinforcing because it is paired with other reinforcers. So the first time you get money, it doesn't mean anything to you until you go to Walmart and figure out you can exchange it for any number of things. Tokens are examples of condition reinforcers that endure and can be accumulated and exchanged for backup reinforcers. So you build up your tokens. <clears throat> now we're going to be talking about uh, prices basically for different things in a second. But the great thing about tokens is that a child, student, adult, this does not have to be done with children. I tend to use that term, but it could be done with anyone. The person who's being conditioned could exchange their tokens as soon as possible to get something small or they could save up their tokens to get a larger prize and so we're also teaching responsibility here as well so a token economy is a behavior modification program that uses tokens typically with a group of individuals this does not have to be done with a group of individuals um, there was a time when, uh, you ha as a parent, you, you kind of go through different phases of your kid's life. You have to switch things up when, when something's working or not working. But there was a time when I did a token economy with my kids. And that was two at the time. And that was not a large group, but it worked for us. It worked well. So the way I did that was each of my kids had a Ziploc bag. And when they did certain behaviors, they would get a ticket in their bag. So I went to Dollar Tree, love a Dollar Tree, right? And got like a large thing of um, like raffle tickets. 
And so I would put tickets in their bag and then they had a menu they could choose from of different backup reinforcers, things like go to get ice cream, go play at the park, extra TV time, that kind of thing. So it does not have to be done with a group, but it can be done with a group and it does make it a little bit easier when you're trying to reinforce so many different people, it's easier to keep track of this way. All right, so tokens are great because they can be given immediately, which is the most reinforcing way, because they can be paired with many different backup reinforcers, which is also very effective, and because they can be administered to large, diverse groups. Now, I've talked a lot about how to use this in the classroom, but sometimes uh, things like an institution, maybe there's like a mental health institution uh, where they have individuals there who have psychological issues. Um, maybe if we have a place where we have adults that have intellectual disability, that kind of thing. There are any number of settings in which you could use tokens. All you have to do is find backup reinforcers that the individuals are willing to work for, and then any kind of behavior can be reinforced. If you're talking about a classroom setting, you can reinforce following the rules. You can reinforce um, raising your hand. You can reinforce doing a good job on your work. But if you're talking about maybe an institutional setting, you can reinforce proper social skills. You can reinforce um, taking your medication, complying with treatment, any number of things. So while token economies sound like simple things that we do with young children, and they are, they can also be really helpful with uh, adults as well. So you can have your own token economy for reinforcing yourself for, you know, waking up on time or going to the gym or you know, getting more than five hours of sleep or something like that. I think that's the thing I hear most from college students that shocks me is how little sleep you guys get. But I'm not your mom. I'm somebody's mom, but I'm not your mom. Go take a nap. All right, setting up a token economy. First of all, you have to decide on your target behavior. This is what you're going to be giving the token for. This is what we want to reinforce. Now, you may have several behaviors in mind. I would suggest that if you're working with a group, it may be easiest to start off with just one or two easily apparent behaviors. So for example, staying in your desk. That's a simple behavior the teacher can see whether you're staying in your desk. Uh, or raising your hand. The teacher can see when you've raised your hand. It makes it a little bit easier. If you do something like be nice to your classmates, well, maybe they're going to be nice and you miss that. You don't see them being nice or they'll start claiming that that's too vague. So choose target behaviors that are specific. And you probably want to start off with just a couple. Maybe I wouldn't do more than three for sure because it can get really confusing. If you have 25 students and you have several different behaviors you're giving tokens for, it could get out of hand quickly. It talks about taking a baseline here. This just means measuring the behavior before you start your token economy. This is because you want to make sure that your token economy is effective. So if you're trying to increase hand raising, you want your students to raise their hand before they speak, you need to know how often they're doing that before you start your token economy. And then you can continue to measure it afterwards to see if it's improving. If it's not improving, then there's something in your token economy that's not working out well, working out well, I should say. And that could be because of the backup reinforcers you choose. So if you don't choose backup reinforcers that the person wants, then they're not really reinforced, they're not motivated. So select backup reinforcers. If possible, choose several backup reinforcers that the individual is interested in. All right, now once you choose the behavior you want to increase and the backup, uh, backup reinforcer, what they're going to get, you have to choose a token that they can build up to, to exchange for their backup reinforcer. Now, I've already talked about a few different types, a few examples as we go gone throughout this lecture, but they really can take any form that works for you. Um, I've seen uh, people suggest maybe having... Um, like, um, what am I, what's the word I'm looking for? Like a coupon, something like that, where like you as the teacher put your initials and the student's initials on it, something like that. Uh, as I've talked about using tokens, you can put pennies. You can have a jar and for every good behavior they put in a penny 
and then every 10 pennies they get to go to the prize box, that kind of thing. There are several different options and really anything that works for you could work. However, you need to make sure that they are durable. Uh, if a student earns a token and then that token is lost or that token is broken, then the person does not get the reinforcement. Now, I do understand there's an argument to be made here for responsibility. You want the, the child to learn to keep up with his or her tokens. <clears throat> but that's something to especially be thinking about with older children. With a younger child, if a child gets a token and then it's lost or it's destroyed, the child doesn't get the reinforcer. They don't really get to exchange for backup reinforcers, and so then they're not going to do that behavior that you wanted them to do. So you would also have to decide where you wanted to keep the tokens. Is this something that only the teacher has access to and the teacher keeps up with it, or is this something that students keep up with? If it's something the students are going to be keeping up with, you want to make sure that it's easy for them to handle <clears throat> and difficult to steal and counterfeit. Surely this doesn't happen, right? Yeah, absolutely. What happens if student A earns a token, student B steals that token, and then student B turns in token for reward? What happened there was student A did the behavior and got punished for it. Student B didn't do the proper behavior. Instead, they stole and they were reinforced for stealing. So you want to make it difficult to steal and difficult to counterfeit. So, for example, if you put pennies in a jar, it would be pretty easy for a student to bring in pennies they find at home and put them in the jar when you're not looking and make it seem like they have more tokens than they actually do. So, something that is customized, perhaps, like, for example, if each child had a different color, <clears throat> then it wouldn't benefit me to steal someone else's because my color is red and their color is green. So I wouldn't be able to turn in their green token anyway. If I steal it, then everybody will know that I took it from them. So you'll have to come up with some kind of system here to keep your students honest. A few other things to think about. How frequently will the backup reinforcers be made available? How often will I let the individual exchange their tokens? Well, I feel like we've said this before. It's best to start off allowing them to exchange them early in the very beginning. So three times you get to go to the prize box, maybe. But then as they get used to it and as they find uh, the backup reinforcers more enticing, then they'll be able to wait a little bit longer. In addition, you have to think about how much each reinforcer will cost. So when we're talking about your backup reinforcers, you want to make sure that they are exchanging an appropriate number of tokens for them. Otherwise, things will uh, stop working very quickly. So let me give you an example. <clears throat> I worked with uh, a group of adolescent uh, males that had anger issues uh, as part of like a group therapy thing and we were trying to do a token economy but the thing that was tricky was that one of our um, one of our prizes was candy but the students initially weren't doing the work very much so they didn't get many points so it, it would be like at the end of a session, they had enough points to get one Jolly Rancher. Well, that's not super reinforcing. Like, they they're, don't have too many points. All I can get is a Jolly Rancher. Why would I even come? The Jolly Rancher is not enough. So sometimes we make things too expensive. And if we make it too expensive, they feel like it's not worth the work. But it's also a problem if we make things too cheap. Because then the person might say, okay, well, I did minimal effort and I got everything I wanted out of the prize box. So now I'm good for a while. I don't need to do this behavior anymore. So making sure that you're setting an appropriate cost for each reinforcer. Also, token economies are intended to be used primarily as reinforcement, but it could be used as punishment as well. So when you do good behavior, you get tokens, and you can exchange your tokens for backup reinforcers. When you do bad behaviors, you lose tokens. So this is something to keep in mind. On the one hand, this could be problematic because the child did the good behavior to get the token. If you take those tokens away, they won't get reinforced for that good behavior they did. But on the other hand, 
if it's a serious enough behavior that punishment is needed, we do want to make sure that we are administering a consistent punishment. So you could also have a fine here. The way I did this when I was doing my token economy with my kids was if they went in timeout, then addition, in addition to the timeout, they also lost a ticket. And that was pretty easy for me to keep track of while they were in the chair having their timeout moment. I made sure they could see me taking their ticket out of their bag. Uh, however, you may have to teach clients, students, children, whoever it is, how to handle this because this may be something that's very hard on them initially. Uh, and so you might have to have you know, a conversation about how this is you know, calm. This is not something that's vindictive. This is not something that's me trying to be cruel to you. This is me teaching you a good behavior and teaching you not to engage in bad behaviors. So it may take a little time for students to get used to that. All right, you need to think in advance about potential problems because with any kind of behavior modification plan, you'll have issues come up. There's one problem in particular I want to mention here because this is probably one of the most common ones. What happens when you're doing a token economy and it's working great and all of a sudden it stops working? The child stops doing the good behavior. What happened? <clears throat> well, there are many potential things that could happen, but I think one of the most common things is the backup reinforcers are just not interesting anymore. So even if you choose what you think of as good backup reinforcers, you still need to mix them up every once in a while. Bring in something new. Ask the child what they're willing to work for. When we were doing our uh, group that I was talking about a minute ago, we asked, there were certain uh, like bracelet, like rubber bracelet things that, that were cool. Now, of course, I have no idea what's cool whatsoever. I'm not sure I knew what was cool when I was y'all's age, but I certainly don't know what's cool now. But you can just ask, like, what's a small thing that I could include in my prize box that would make you be interested in it again? Because oftentimes we've just gotten tired of the reward. Or another potential problem could be that you're not being consistent with it. You stopped giving the backup reinforcer or you've stopped giving the tokens. And so because of that, they've lost interest. All right. <clears throat> One last thing here before we talk about our activity. So token economies are fantastic for a time, but nothing lasts forever. So token economies should be designed so that social reinforcement gradually replaces tokens. Think about this for a second. If you're a third grade teacher and you're doing a token economy with your students, but it's getting close to the end of the year and the students are gonna be going to the fourth grade classroom soon and you know that the fourth grade classroom, that teacher's not gonna do a token economy. You don't want your students to lose everything they've already learned. Or what happens as a parent when you've been doing your token economy for a while, the behavior is pretty firmly established, and you don't want to keep doing the token economy anymore? Well, basically what you're going to do is you're going to gradually wean them off of it. Uh, eliminate tokens, so don't give as many tokens. Decrease token value. Um, basically what you're going to do here is gradually wean the person off of the tokens. Now, I know what you're saying. If we stop with the tokens, the behavior will stop. Well, not if we replace it with a different kind of reinforcement. And one kind of reinforcement that is something that you can typically find in most settings would be social reinforcement. So the fourth grade teacher may not give out pennies in a jar every time you do your homework, but the fourth grade teacher might give you a pat on the back, good job, praise. So social reinforcement, being friendly, giving a person praise and compliments, those are things that people typically do even without um, a plan for reinforcement. It's just something that kind of naturally happens. So if you're concerned about the behavior continuing, then you want to help the person start to see the social reinforcement side of things. In addition, helping them see how this benefits them. So doing your homework, to get a prize out of the prize box is great, but doing your homework helps you make a good grade. Keeps your parents off your back, right? Makes you feel good about yourself. Also, getting good grades now means that you'll probably be more successful in the future, meet your long-term goals, that kind of thing. So you're gonna try to help them replace the token economy with other types of reinforcers. All right, so activity 11, and refer back to my announcement about the activities, I'm gonna keep your top 10 activity grades. 
so you do have two drop grades to use as you see fit. If this is confusing to you, if you're trying to decide whether or not you need to do it, you can email me. Um, but basically just you want 10 high activity grades. All right, activity 11. Imagine that you're the teacher for a second grade class. So second grade, probably seven, seven year olds. And you've decided to implement a token economy with your students. So what I want you to do is discuss how you could do that. Remember that your responses need to be at least 200 words long, and I want you to include things like what behaviors would you reinforce. So choose a few behaviors you think would be especially important for second graders in a classroom setting. What would you use as tokens, as the condition reinforcers? What would you use as backup reinforcers? And then you could also discuss what kinds of problems you might run into with this, how you might plan for those, that kind of thing. So just tell me your plan for using a token economy if you were a teacher of a second grade class. All right, so that is the end of today's lecture. Please feel free to let me know if you have any questions or concerns. Otherwise, during our next lecture, we'll be carrying on talking a little bit more about behavior modification. We'll talk about how to assess for different potential causes of problem behavior and then how to tailor our behavior modification plan to meet specific causes. So we'll talk more about that next time. Let me know if you need anything. You guys have a great day.